I'm gonna show you three birds. Two of them are very closely related, and one of them eats the other two. And I bet you won't be able to guess which is which. The birds of the Ecuadorian cloud forest have some crazy stories, and today we're gonna share six of them that will absolutely blow your mind. The cloud forests of the Ecuadorian Andes are one of the most unique ecosystems on Earth, and nestled right in the center of this breathtaking landscape is the Mindo Valley. Located on the western slope of the Andes, Mindo is among the world's most famous destinations for birding, and that's exactly what's brought us here today. My name is Evan, and this is Harrison. We're twin brothers on a mission to make you an insider in the natural world. And to do that, we're going to bring you into the lives of some of this region's most spectacular birds. Our plan today is simple. To show off how diverse this place really is, we'll be exploring at several different altitudes, starting in a high elevation forest and working our way down to the lower valley to see how the bird life changes from spot to spot. There's an insane amount of stuff to see here, so to help keep track of everything we find, we'll be life listing, which essentially involves keeping a list of every species we observe and adding it to the growing list of animals we've seen throughout our lives. It's a pretty basic activity at its core, but if you focus your efforts through a mission like this one, it can teach you a ton about the world around you. And trust me when I tell you, there's a lot to learn about the birds here. Life in the cloud forest can be very tough for birds, but they've adapted to this challenge in some pretty fascinating ways. These are stories that you really need to see to believe, so there's nothing left to do but start birding. Our first stop is a lodge situated at 2200 meters in elevation, and that gives us some shots at incredible mountain-dwelling species. There are lots of hummingbirds here, mountain tanagers, and even some mountain toucans. So we're gonna set up the big camera and focus on some of these feeders, and if we're lucky, get a great assemblage of species at the highest elevation point we're gonna be visiting. Once we got set up at the first location, we could immediately tell why this habitat is called the cloud forest. We looked out at the valley below us and saw that we were literally above the clouds, which I have to say was pretty awesome to see. But our attention was immediately stolen by a lot of the birds that were coming in, and many of them were tanagers. Tanagers are small songbirds that are famous for their bright coloration and active foraging behavior that makes them really interesting to watch. And one of the coolest things about them is that tanagers come in almost any color you can imagine. There are blue ones, there are green ones, there are yellow ones, and they were a staple literally everywhere we went in the cloud forest. But here at the higher elevations, there are some species that are specialized for these altitudes, the mountain tanagers that were some of our biggest targets. And one that we got to check off at this site is the blue-winged mountain tanager, which is one of the birds that inspired us to make the cloud forest one of our destinations in Ecuador. Tanagers are actually the second largest family of birds, and there are over 380 species distributed across the Americas, and a whopping 18% of them are found right here in the Andes. So this is actually one of the best places in the entire world to see these birds in the wild. Tanagers really exemplify what's so exciting about birding the cloud forest. There are so many unique species around, the colors are absolutely striking. Pretty much everywhere you look, it feels like there's another beautiful gem bouncing around in the trees, and each one is more beautiful than the last. Now you'd think with so many birds around, it wouldn't be that hard to find stuff, but actually, if we had tried to life list just in the natural forest, it's possible we wouldn't have gotten any good shots at all. The vegetation here is just so dense, and so many of the birds are pretty skittish that getting shots would be nearly impossible. However, there are some opportunities provided by the ecotourism lodges here that gave us a great shot at a lot of the birds. A common practice for lodges in this area is to set up feeding stations, where they leave out fruit or other foods that attract birds in so visitors can get an up-close look. Now, it's a bit unusual for us to hang out in places like this because we like to film animals in their natural habitat as much as possible. But you have to remember, these are completely wild birds. They've just become used to this arrangement and don't mind the people around as they're getting an easy meal. And this strategy worked out really well for us because we didn't have a lot of time to spend at each location. The feeders basically gave us a snapshot of what birds were around in that area, which is perfect for a life listing mission like the one we were doing and it allowed us to get many more species much faster than we could otherwise. 
Now we staked out the feeders for a while and we're actually getting some pretty great shots, but the next bird that arrived totally made the morning for us. A group of plate-built mountain toucans, one of our biggest target species, has flown into the feeders. There are at least three of them, and it's attracted a lot of attention, and for good reason. This is not only one of the rarest toucan species that we can find here in Ecuador, but also absolutely one of the most iconic. They're beautiful. Plate-built mountain toucans are really popular among birders for their unusual coloration and the striking pattern on their beak. And these birds are mountain specialists. They regularly hang out at elevations of 2,600 meters or more. And they've even been sighted at 3,100 meters, which is well over 10,000 feet, which is an incredibly high elevation for a toucan. Now, what's really special about these birds is that they can only be found here on the western slope of the Andes and a tiny sliver of Colombia, which makes them an endemic species, one that is restricted to only one region and can't be found anywhere else in the world. They are one of literally hundreds of endemic species you can find in the cloud forest because the conditions are so unique that it's allowed many species of reptiles, birds, invertebrates, and even plants to specialize to this habitat. This encounter was the best way I could have imagined ending our time at the high elevation spot, and our first life listing stop was a complete success. We added 11 new species to our life list here, and among them were some of our biggest targets in the cloud forest. We really thought that this first location was going to be hard to beat, but it turned out that moving down the elevational gradient actually worked in our favor. And as we arrived at the second spot, things were already looking very promising. Even though we've only descended a few thousand meters in elevation, the habitat type has totally changed. As you can see behind me, the understory is much denser in this area, and all this vegetation supports a lot of forest-dwelling birds that we haven't had the opportunity to see yet. And some of these species are really impressive. The real challenge here is knowing what to point the camera at first. They're all moving around at the same time, and it's really hard to stay focused when there are so many new species for us to pick up and so much we want to film, but it is an amazing problem to have. By the time we arrived, the feeders were already bustling with activity, and one bird in particular caught our attention because its color was oddly familiar. But it turned out that this was a totally new species to us, the toucan barbet. Now, barbets are an interesting group of birds that are actually most closely related to toucans, and they can be found throughout the tropical Americas and also in parts of Africa and Asia. Now, this is where things get complicated. The toucan barbet looks strikingly similar to the plate-billed mountain toucan, and we noticed that in the field, and we were really curious about why that is. So we did some digging, and it turns out that the story is incredibly weird. It was once thought that all barbets around the world are related to each other in the same family, but recent evidence has suggested that the barbets in the Americas are actually quite different from the barbets in Africa and Asia, and they each represent their own unique family. Things get even crazier when you realize that the toucan barbet is actually more closely related to true toucans than it is even to other New World barbets, like these red-headed barbets we saw at the same location. And that has some really interesting implications when you consider the diets of these birds. Despite how similar they look, the biggest difference between the toucan barbet and the plate-billed mountain toucan is the size of their beak, and that reflects what they're eating. Now, there weren't any mountain toucans at this elevation, but we did get to see several other toucan species, including this pair of crimson-rumped toucanets that came down to the feeding station, and also this beautiful pale mandible darasari, which we can use as a point of comparison. In a previous video, we explained how you can use the shape of a bird's beak to extrapolate what it eats. And while barbets use their small conical beaks to eat almost exclusively fruit, toucans will also eat fruit but use their larger, sharper beaks to take lots of protein as well, including things like invertebrates, reptiles like lizards, and even other birds. They will regularly raid the nests of other species and eat both their eggs and their chicks. And strangely enough, this even includes the toucan barbet. What makes this so bizarre is that because the toucan barbet is believed to have evolved before true toucans, and they share such a recent common ancestor, what's basically happening here is one bird has diversified into many, and the larger species have now evolved to feed on their own relatives. So in a way, their common ancestor has diversified to the point where they're literally eating themselves. 
And a lot of toucans are like this. They'll eat a ton of fruit, but also a surprising amount of animals. So it kind of makes you think about these adorable birds a little bit differently. Now, this location was incredible. We added 14 new species to our life list, even more than the previous location. And this had our spirits really high as we moved to the next spot. We've reached the final lodge that we're going to be visiting today, and once again, the bird species assemblage has changed. We're seeing a lot of understory and lower forest birds that we weren't going to see as we were higher up in the mountains. And if we're lucky, we'll be able to add a few more lifers to our list before we wrap it. But we still have some light left, so we're going to see what we can find. The low elevation spot really felt more like a proper rainforest than the other locations we had visited. It was a lot hotter, it was darker, more humid. Not to mention way more buggy. Oh yeah. And while that was challenging for us, it brought out one of the forest's most interesting predators. We have a masked trogan, a male, sitting right above us on the trail here. Evan is getting some footage. My lifer actually is the first one I've seen. He is absolutely beautiful really stunning red stomach very clear tail markings that we can use to distinguish this species i hope something good comes out this is one of the forest dwelling birds that we really wanted to see competition is fierce in the cloud forest and it takes a lot of energy to scour this habitat looking for food but trogans have a really efficient way around this problem they're known for sitting motionless in the vegetation for long periods of time and this is actually part of their hunting behavior. Trogans use a technique called hawking, where a bird will sit in the same spot and look for food like fruit or a passing insect flying by. And when they spot it, they'll swoop down, catch the prey item out of the air, and then return to their perch to feed. There are actually a lot of cloud forest birds that engage in this behavior, and we got to see it in action with an ornate flycatcher, one of the masters of this technique. Now, hawking allows birds to save a lot of energy that they'd otherwise waste by foraging actively. And it also has the added benefit of giving us a great look at them while they're doing this. We were very happy to have seen this behavior, but as we were making our way back to the lodge, we heard the call of a bird that we have been waiting to feature on the channel again for many years. That is the mot mot. It's probably a rufous mot mot. I imagine it's right in front of where we're looking. There are a lot of birds in this one patch of palms here. So maybe we'll be able to get a camera on it. We tried to follow the calls through the forest for a while, but with habitat this thick, that went about as well as you'd expect. However, when we got back to the lodge, we had an incredible stroke of luck. Because a flash of movement in the trees that caught our eye turned out to be exactly what we were looking for. It's very hard to see, but there is a Rufus Mott Mott sitting in the trees right here. And we are literally right next to our lodge. We've seen toucans in these trees. There's now a Mott Mott here. This is extremely encouraging that we're able to see some of these forest dwelling birds right next to human settlements. Now, this is one bird we could not come to the cloud forest without sharing with you because their story is absolutely incredible. Motmots are pretty abundant in these lower elevation forests, but they face a lot of predators, everything from cats to birds of prey to large snakes. And while they don't have many defensive adaptations to fight off a predator, they have devised a strategy to stop an attack before it even starts. The first thing you'll notice about a motmot if you see one in the wild is how long and impressive their tails are, and that's actually imperative to their survival. When a motmot detects a predator, it will face directly at them and swing its tail back and forth in the motion of a pendulum. And to a lot of people, that kind of resembles a grandfather clock, which has earned them the nickname, the clock bird. Now this is a signal to the predator that they've been spotted. And if they were to try to catch the motmot, it would just fly away before they ever had a chance. So by listening to this signal, it actually saves the predator and the motmot a lot of valuable energy. What's so cool about this interaction is that it's almost like a prey animal talking to its predator, which is really not something you see with a lot of animals. That's true. We often think about how cool it would be if we were able to talk to animals or something like that, and that's kind of what's happening here. Two different species have found a way to communicate to each other in a way that helps them both survive. 
we picked up another five lifers at the last spot, which doesn't sound like a lot, but we were actually really happy. You have to consider the fact that we had been birding intensely for the entire day, and actually several days prior to this as well. So for us to still be getting new species for our life list just goes to show how diverse the cloud forest really is. There is truly no place on Earth like the Mindo Valley. I don't know of anywhere else where you can find this many rare and totally unique birds so easily in just one day. The bizarre survival strategies that these animals have evolved is a testament to how complex life in the cloud forest is. And what our life listing efforts here have made us realize is that not only are these communities incredibly diverse, but the animals are all intricately connected to each other in ways that we are only beginning to understand. We have a lot to learn about this place, but unfortunately, there is no shortage of threats that could destroy the entire thing. And as usual, one of the biggest is humans. Over 90% of Ecuador's cloud forests have already been cleared for development like cattle ranching, and the few patches that remain are now being literally pushed to their limit by climate change. This habitat can only exist at certain altitudes and if very specific climatic conditions are met. And while some ecosystems may be able to adapt to our warming planet by moving towards the poles or up in elevation, the cloud forest is already pretty much as high as it can go, and the plants can't disperse far enough to escape from where they currently sit. If we want to keep the amazing life stories here going into the future, we have to protect the habitat that remains where it exists. And that means figuring out a lot more about how the birds fit into their ecosystem so we know what we need to focus on. There are actually some tricks that you can pick up to use simple bird observations to learn a ton of fascinating things about their lives. And if you want to try this insider technique for yourself, check out this video where we teach you the way that we study birds in the field and show you how you can see these animals in a whole new way. And with that, we hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you in the next one.